Approaching Zion. Come follow me. For May 20th to the 26th, we're looking at Messiah chapters 18 to 24. Another six chapter episode. Yeah, there's a lot of content in this one. It's like they're trying to get through Mosiah as fast as possible. They know that Alma's coming up, and that's going to take a majority of the year. <laughs> like, a, like a very good portion of the year. <laughs> All right. And let's see. We're, this is kind of a, a revolutionary episode because you're not wearing a hat. I know. Well, we got that comment about me always wearing my hat and my cowboy hat inside because I'm bald. I was like, no, I've got to show. I still have a little bit of hair left. So, <laughs> this will be the one time. Uh, maybe I've done it once before. I can't remember now. I'm also playing around with some studio lighting. So, we got uh, kind of more spotlights on. More, I don't know, a little more shadow, a little more depth. I don't know. Let us know how it looks if you're watching this on YouTube. <laughs> okay, the title of this Come Follow Me chapter is We Have Entered Into a Covenant with Him. Good title. There's a lot here with that. Good title. We're going to be looking at Alma. You want to just jump right in? Just jump right in, man. There's so much to go over. And it starts off with Alma and obviously King Noah and his priests have just killed Abinadi. Alma, though, has fled and and escaped, you know, the um, the, the, the chaos that's going on with the death of, of Abinadi. And now he goes and, and has find, found this solitude, this place to hide, and now is beginning to preach the word of God as, as he had heard it from Abinadi. Right. And the, the manual just starts off by making the comment that these were deep believers in Christ. And the manual asks us to consider how, um, well, it says, consider how deeply the believers, described in Isaiah chapter 18, felt about Jesus Christ. They had to meet secretly at great risk mm. to learn about him. And when given the chance to show their commitment by the covenant of baptism, they clapped their hands for joy and exclaimed, this is the desire of our hearts. You know, one of the things I want to point out here, too, is we've talked about this previously, but the the concept and the understanding that Alma went out and repented of his sins he received a remission of his sins. The people he then preaches to who accept what he's teaching is true, they repent of their sins. They receive that remission of sins. But they have not yet been baptized. They have not entered into that covenant or entered, it, entered into the kingdom of God up to this point. And as we discussed previously, this is so important for us to understand in the church is that there are those who, who have a true, willing heart and desire to receive a remission of sins, and the Spirit can grant that to them, what we're seeking to give is retainment of that forgiveness of sin, that remission of sin. And entering into the kingdom of yes, God. Yes, and entering into the kingdom of God. That's really what we're offering to the humble and to the penitent believers in Christ who are not members of our church, is, yes, you've received a remission of your sins, but we can provide a path to retain it and to enter his kingdom so that you can receive the fullness of his grace. Mm -hmm. And that's what Alma is going through here, is that he receives that remission, he's giving that remission to other people, but they have not yet entered the kingdom and retained yeah. that remission. We see that a lot with the early converts, with Joseph Smith, that these were people that were devoutly seeking Christ mm -hmm. and his kingdom. Many of them actually recognized very clearly that how the kingdom of God should look and be organized on the earth, and they were very aware that it's, it's not here. Mm -hmm. And those people, they were simply waiting for it to be presented to them, yep. for them to go, ah, oh, there it is, I'm in. Right? And, and they joined with gladness of heart. And, you know, that's, I think that's really what you're talking about. That there's, when, when saying the field is white, there's mm -hmm. there's people out there that, like, whether, you know, whether they think about it that specifically or not, like, their heart is correct. Yeah. And their, their willingness is correct. And, when it's presented to them, it clicks, and they say, this is it. Well, it's it's interesting, too, because in, in Sunday school a couple of weeks ago, I actually presented this idea and this understanding to the class to say, hey, we need to understand that there are the Spirit is really working on people in and out of the church. Now, that's obvious that, you know, that people understand that. But there was a, an elderly lady in the class who's well into her 90s, 
And it seemed to really touch her because she she stated that, you know, before I joined the church, I really had some profound spiritual experiences. I had really started to develop a true, devout testimony in Christ. And I wasn't really sure how to process that once I found the church and accepted the church as true. It's like, what do I do with what I had felt previously? And in our missionary efforts, we need to validate those feelings. We need to appreciate and help people understand that what they have felt is a hundred percent in line with and communion with the spirit. And what we're seeking to do now is take them the next step forward in that spiritual journey, taking them a little further down the path to now approach the gate, which they've already been walking towards and enter therein. And that's what we're giving. And that's what Alma starts to discover here is that there is covenants to be made that provide greater manifestations of the spirit. Another thing to consider we see this throughout the Book of Mormon is just how the followers of Christ are persecuted. Mm. And often it is actually like they're criminals. Like they're they're considered like they're wanted for prison. Mm-hmm. Um some you know, a lot of times just for the fact that they are Christian or just for the boldness that of, of preaching truth publicly and coming me maybe even calling out the hypocrisy of, of the ruling class. I mean, we see that with Jesus himself, of course, but I mean, it, the Book of Mormon starts with Lehi and Nephi essentially becoming criminals and having to flee. Yeah. <laughs> flee, flee Jerusalem. And it's like, we, of course, we always kind of look at it and like, oh, like, you know, like they're, you know, they're, they're prophets. We, we, we read it in hindsight, knowing of the great things and the restoration of the gospel. We already come into the Book of Mormon as sacred scripture and, and approaching it that way. But, but you, have to, you need to consider that sometimes, like, following truth, embracing the gospel, like, it, it, it's, it's not as rosy as we, as we like to think it is or that it is at the current moment right now. Well, I mean, we can look at just church history and yeah. see that, obviously. Well, we need to accept the fact that regardless of what how things appear on the surface the truth is underneath when push comes to shove the true believers of christ just like alma here it is there it is not reconcilable with babylon and the laws and the oaths and the covenants that the adversary willingly or people's unwillingly or or, or ignorance of what they're entering into in babylon those are real and they will always be at odds with truths and the oath and covenant that God gives his chosen people. And that a certain point, the persecutions, the afflictions and the difficulties will by necessity occur for those who are true believers in Christ. And the day will come and is coming when we as true believers will have to make that choice of, I will be an outcast. I will have to flee and willingly flee so that I may worship the Lord and fulfill his purposes because Babylon can no longer, they can no longer have, uh, um, uh, embrace it or accept it. I think it's a very good thought experiment as members of the church to just mentally prepare for the idea that what, how would you handle the situation where being a member of the church like affects you economically mm-hmm. and financially, mm-hmm. yep. uh, affects the, the quality of your living conditions. I mean, how deep is your testimony of the restoration, of Joseph Smith, of of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it something that's culturally nice, and it's you're there for the community aspect, or is it something where you're deeply spiritually converted? Yeah. Um, well, you know, the truth is, and we see this in the Book of Mormon, political climates can change fast. Yeah. Really, like within the span of a few years. And we like to think that, you know, the United States, it's very stable, you know, thing, you know, it's going to kind of remain status quo forever. And history tells us that's will not be the case. When and how those changes occur, anybody's guess, but we need to prepare ourselves like mentally and spiritually for the moment where we might have to make tough decisions. Well, what we need to accept and what we'll talk about here in as part of this lesson is the people of Alma when they establish a right a, a righteous city or a righteous place the consequences of babylon or of iniquity and unrighteous living has an effect on them 
and and it comes for them as well and they have to bear burdens because of the consequences of that iniquity we should not look at these scriptures and assume that when things start to fall apart the people of god or the church are going to be somehow miraculously left on this pedestal untouched by the fall thereof that that's foolish and unwise the truth is we will be impacted we will be affected and we as individuals or as patriarchs must be able and willing to bear that burden um and and move forward understanding that that the trials and tribulations are coming for everybody so let's get into chapter 18 we're talking about baptism the covenant of baptism of course this is a very famous chapter that explains the covenant of baptism so beautifully yeah I know as, as a missionary, this is one we'd go to all the time. We're trying to get people to accept baptism and explain what the covenant is and, and, and what it means and try to get them excited about uh, joining the, the household of, of faith. And it says here, it is copying some stuff out of chapter 18, but he did teach them, Alma did teach them and did preach unto them repentance and redemption and faith on the Lord. So first principles of the gospel, plan of salvation. And the people were desirous to come into the fold of God and to be called his people. And they were willing to bear one another's burdens, mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that you may be in, even until death. And it says that baptism is a witness before God that you have entered into a covenant with him, that you will serve him and keep his commandments, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. So a lot to unpack there, but baptism, it's a witness, right? We even perform baptism with witnesses. That's an important aspect of how we practice it. And it is a covenant. It is a symbol of a covenant that we make in our heart with the Lord. And what is that what is that covenant? Well, primarily it's willingness, it's disposition. That we're we're willing to follow him, that we are pointing ourselves in his direction. And that's going to be the direction we we progress the rest of our lives in. And a lot of these things bear each other's burdens, mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort. I mean, those those are things that that family members do to one another, right? It's it's really symbolic of of coming into the awareness that we're all God's children and that we should all treat each other with the same love and respect that a parent has for their child or, or among siblings or extended family, right? I mean, we, we, we all can relate with the fact that if, when a family member comes asking for help, it has more weight, more significance than when an acquaintance or someone we barely know comes asking for help. Obviously, the gospel, the fullness of the gospel is, is, is for us to overcome that to start seeing all of God's children as family and to develop that charity and, and, and its perfection that that Jesus Christ had, but I mean that's that's kind of what we're seeing here is that baptism is really the is the willingness of heart to be charitable yeah. and to and to not be discriminatory against any of God's children for appearance or things they choices they made in their life or whatever the case may be. You know the outcome of this too, and it says in in verse sixteen shortly hereafter, it talks about how. After they are baptized, after they willingly enter into this covenantal relationship with the Lord, it says they were filled with the grace of God. Now, that does not mean they had not received a portion of that grace up to this point. Clearly, they had. They had felt this remission of sins. They had repented and humbled themselves. But only after entering that covenant were they filled where they were full now of that grace um, that, that God can provide to his covenantal children. And that ultimately leads to what? Well, it leads to them now, later on in this chapter, starting to live more of the the law of consecration, truly fulfilling yeah. what they're willing to do at baptism. Now, that grace enables them 
to start having that view of their fellow man in in that Christ-like love where they they care for one another, they take care of one another, they share with each other. The, those who have more give to those who have not. And there is an, an, an equality of outcome, but not by force or compulsion, but by willingness to enter in and live that covenantal relationship. They willingly have covenanted to say, we will share all things and have all things in common. And, and that's very difficult sometimes to put into practice today, but something we need to be thinking about is how can I willingly try and create as, as best as I can an equality of outcome, not by force or compulsion the way Babylon tries to do it today, but by willingly living the covenantal relationship I have enter, entered into. So you talk about that you know, they received the grace. Well, how is it worded? It says, and we're filled with the grace they of were God. Filled with the grace of God. And... And now I'm also teaches here that the baptism serves the purpose that the God may pour out his spiritly more abundantly upon you. I just think that's right. interesting that he kind of is using spirit and grace synonymously. Right. Here. And he show. I mean, this is teaching that the, that covenant entering into a covenant relationship with God is actually the way to unlock or have greater access to his grace. A hundred percent. And the, the, the result of uh, uh, unlocking the grace of Jesus Christ is his spirit fills us. Yeah. And it, fall, it, pour, it is poured out more abundantly upon us. Yes. And, and I mean, I, we can see here that baptism is really a precursor to all of the um, covenants we make in the temple. I mean, you can see it's a witness that we will keep the commandments, obedience. It will stand as witnesses of God even until death. Yeah. Sacrifice. Yeah. As, as you say, Alma goes on then to teach them uh, consecration, which I think is, we might have on another slide here. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, 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 a, it, it, it's a softer mm -hmm. entry level covenant, but it's already like anyone who's made the covenant of baptism has already, they're already accepted to the fact that they're going to be seeking to live higher laws mm -hmm. and the the ordinances of and the covenants of the temple is really just a uh a continuation yes or correct. a fullness of the baptismal covenant mm -hmm. that you've already made and then i've got kind of a funny slide here is that alma alma performs kind of a different kind of baptism <laughs> than we're used to in the church today first of all alma had authority but where did he get authority from well if, and I put on here, Alma received authority from King Noah, right? Because King Noah was wicked. Yeah. So how does that work? Well, it's clear that if we remember, King Noah comes in, the priests that were there who were righteous were put down, as it says in the scriptures. <laughs> that being said, new priests were consecrated or clearly somebody who did have the keys granted those keys or bestowed those keys upon these new priests who then acted in agency wickedly. Yeah. King Noah was legitimately the king. Yes, correct. He had authority mm -hmm. that had been handed down to him and he could call priests. Yeah. And he could give them authority. And it's kind of, it's, it's almost kind of like that, like, um, you know, when, when the church is the state, you know, both legal and spiritual authority comes from the same source, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of, you know, that's kind of what we see with uh, in in kind of the fullness of Zion and how when you know when when the when Zion's organized as a spiritual government as well as a kind of political government that's you know that becomes a little more obvious, but yeah. So what we, what we kind of figure out here is that authority and power are two different things. Yeah, and we've talked about that before, but this is a clear a clear example of that is that King Noah or wh whomever he had around him had authority to administer keys or to ordain others to the priesthood, essentially. And, and then as they chose to live unrighteously after the fact, there was no power there, but those keys had been administered and to Alma as well, mm -hmm. who had those keys. Now, once he repented, power came back into his life to administer those keys. And that's that's critical because there may be some listening or m some who are listening who have loved ones or, or spouses or whatever who maybe have been ordained and have received keys but are not living righteously to exercise power thereof. 
but it's important to remember all it takes is repentance. Yeah. We, I say that, you know, somewhat, you know, jokingly because repentance for some people, it, it, it requires a lot. It requires true sacrifice and humility. But if we can repent, the power that can be associated to those keys can come back and, yeah. and immediately start to bless the lives of those around us. Because spiritual power comes from honor. Yes. Integrity. Integrity. Making and keeping covenants. Yes. But authority is legal administration. Mm -hmm. And you're legally approved to do something. Mm -hmm. All right. And that's why to, today, right, we, we kind of see this being kind of correctly interpreted that like today, if, you know, a child, an eight year old is going to be baptized mm -hmm. and the father's not, it, you know, necessarily in, uh, worthy of a temple recommend, it's still approved that the father who has, he's a priest or an elder can, can be approved to baptize their child. You'd say, well, like how, you know, how, how can he be, if he's not worthy, how can he, well, he has, he's ordained an office in the priesthood. Yeah. He has legal authority to baptize, mm -hmm. right? Now, the spiritual power he has and his ability to, to execute, perform other types of spiritual blessings. Well, that's, that's different, yeah. but legal authority to execute ordinances, right. And have them ratified or sealed on earth and in heaven is still valid. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're seeing with, with Alma. And obviously Alma had repented and he was worthy at this point, but you know, his authority came from a time where he was wicked yeah. and even who the person he received authority from was wicked, but that did not negate that the authority itself was valid. Yeah, correct. So it's very interesting. And then we see Alma kind of just makes up his own baptismal ordinance. <laughs> it's not the one we use today. You know, he kind of, he kind of, he uses the opportunity to baptize and teach the baptismal covenant kind of all, all at once. All yeah. At once. You know, I maybe felt kind of pressed for time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, that's, there's another important lesson there that uh, we like to think, you know, God doesn't change and like we've restored the gospel and it's, you know, what it looks like today is how it's always looked like. And mm -hmm. it's like a literal restoration of exactly how it's always been. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that's true. Yeah. But we have to understand that in other ways it's not true and doesn't have to be true. Mm -hmm. Because the purpose of having the fullness of priesthood keys, right? The, the, uh, the president of the church having all of the keys of the priesthood for the earth and for the universe, really. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get literal about it but the point is that he can make he can make judgment calls and executive decisions and he can he can choose uh how the, the gospel is administered mm -hmm. on the earth now we're not going to see prophets rocking the boat and making like crazy change to the gospel because it's been joseph smith did a great job at restoring the gospel yeah he fulfilled his mission but they've clearly changed how some of the ordinances are administered as time's gone by that doesn't yeah. invalidate the ordinance. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Like that's, we're seeing priesthood keys in action yeah. when that happens. That's, that's why we have a prophet and president of the church. Mm -hmm. That's, there's wisdom in the order of that. Yeah. And, you know, if. And clearly the changing of that ordinance is more a reflection on us as a people and where we are culturally or, or, or whatever the case may be to help accommodate what we need or what's going to help fulfill our understanding mm -hmm. of the ordinance. Whereas in Alma's day, the way he goes about administering this ordinance, they had limited time. People were out searching for them. People were trying to kill them. They're getting down into the water. He's probably work, looking around saying, we got to hurry up and get this over with and get back to hiding because people are chasing us down. So yeah, he might've had a more efficient way to administer the baptism and the, 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 the spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the yeah. fire, you know? So he yeah. was clearly administering it the way he saw appropriate for his day. Yeah. And, and he was moved upon by the spirit. Exactly. And yeah. of course the spirit will ratify what it commands to do. Right. I've got an interesting book. Uh, the rights of Christian initiation. Pretty cool book. So it just kind of it, it. It's more of an academic study of just what Christian rites or ordinances have looked like over the past two thousand years. But they found documents from a uh, third, Chris, uh, third early third century Christian uh, church in I think it's Syria mm -hmm. or, or somewhere. But um, what's interesting is they, of, co of course, it's not even an LDS author who who wrote that book, so they don't they they don't really know how to what to make of some of these things and how to interpret it. But through the lens of of, of the restoration with, you know, spiritual discernment, you can see that like these early Christians and now early third century, they, 
might already have been in apostasy, mm. like, you know, at that point, but they were still had very, um, they were still very close to the original apostles and had, you know, were probably pretty close to uh, first century teachings at that point. And what, I, what, what you see is that as part of their baptismal ceremony, uh, they were also performing anointings. And it actually, it, it actually almost word for word describes our, our temple initiatory, where it talks about like w- women uh, anointing other other women for the purpose, like like they did for priests and kings in ancient Israel. And essentially, what we see is that the church was performing the temple initiatory ordinances at the same time as baptism. Mm-hmm. They were they were go- they were converting adults. And they were just, they were knocking out all the ordinances kind of at once, yeah. so it seems. And so it's just interesting. And, you know, of course, they didn't have physical temples, mm-hmm. probably, right, at that time. So it's just interesting to see that, like, things like things can be administered and the gospel can look very different and still be the same. Yeah. It doesn't invalidate the ordinance at all if it's administered differently throughout time. Right, like something, and then you can also give, like, simple examples, like, oh, like, we no longer say who is dead mm-hmm. and and... And the temple ordinances were doing like like here, well, well, you change the ordinance, you change yeah. the words. Does that invalidate? Not if the prophet says yeah. it doesn't. He's got the keys, man. If yeah. he says this is what we're doing now, and he, and of course he's acting by faith in and through the Spirit. Yeah. I mean, he's not just going out there without considering and pondering on these things. Obviously. But if he feels inspired, like, hey, this is a good change. It will be good for the people to kind of change perspective and change yeah. their understanding. The Lord allows it. He allows them to exercise those keys to to administer and to be agents to act he's we are not to be commanded in all things and we have to we have to also like get a grip that the ordinances they are ordinances of salvation Mm -hmm. and exaltation but it is not the ceremonies themselves that say that's correct right it is it is the spirit and the purpose and what we get out of them that really causes the spiritual rebirth and the change of heart necessary to come unto Christ yep. and be saved in him. So we just we got to be a little more open to the spirit, yep. a little more fluid well, as accepting we, that like if we allow the spirit to work in its fullness, like it can do great and marvelous things and those can those can be outside the box. Like not just as a, as a church or as a people, but even individually in our lives, like we we have to be open to seeing things differently, and new perspectives, and and maybe making big changes in in in, in our home or in our lives, and that that's this is all part of the process right. of conversion. And then Alma baptizes himself. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty that's uh, handy. That was handy in that moment. <laughs> So it's kind of like I think that's kind of we saw that with Adam too. I think yeah. in Moses, where he the, with the, the spirit baptizes him, yeah. he sort of takes her to the water. He's, <laughs> He's good to go now. <laughs> so you know why not? I guess <laughs> okay. Uh, and then with these baptisms, and there are several hundred people baptized. The Church of Jesus Christ is now established. They call it the Church of Christ, or the Church of the Messiah, mm-hmm. right? The Church of the Anointed, however you want to word it. Uh, but ev- whosoever was baptized was added to the church. Sounds like there was some record keeping yeah. going on. They were organizing themselves. Well, it, it's interesting too that later on, when when um, King Limhi is recounting this story to Ammon and his brethren who had come up from Zarahemla, Ammon recognizes like this is. This is the church of God. They've entered into the covenant just as we have. We wish we could, you know, be with them. We wish we could be part of of what they've got going on because Ammon had had received of the same ordinances in Zarahemla. So the Lord is setting up his church among the righteous wherever they are to be found. Not dissimilar from today. Now we because of where we are and the technologies we have, we have a centralized location with one you know one prophet one set of apostles to administer that but back in this day the spirit was able to work through righteous men to to set up the same church in different areas by the same authority it's really cool to think about yeah the church is spontaneously like being created like Mm -hmm. separately and then as we see in the future like comes together and joins under uh, one uh, under mosiah and zarahemla yeah it's cool it's cool yeah and we see that and and you know um, third Nephi, where Christ establishes 
the church among the Nephites and calls 12 disciples, essentially apostles. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if, 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 uh, if those two churches had come together, Mm -hmm. right, the disciples of the Americas would have recognized, you know, Peter, James, and John as the first presidency. Correct. And those two churches would have joined as one church. Mm -hmm. Like it would have, it just would have happened naturally and they, they would, they'd be all about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause one church, like this is what I'm teaching, one baptism, one set of doctrine. He starts like he, that, that's that's the purpose of organizing a church is that there can be unity and truth. Well, the interesting thing too, truth. and maybe we'll look at this later on, is when Ammon says, Ammon recognizes that Alma and his people had entered into covenants. That's how we recognize, like, oh, that's the church of God. Like that should be a witness to us is. Today, how should people be or what, what's what been the tried and true method that God has established his truth on the earth? It's through covenants, through authority once again restored to administer covenants to his children. Ammon recognizes that. Like, wait a minute, this Alma guy setting up a church? We have the Church of Christ back in Zarahemla. But as soon as Limhi starts talking about the covenants they entered into and having that authority... Ammon recognizes, oh, that is the church of God. Oh, we're good. Yes, that is how God administers the affairs of his kingdom, is through <laughs> covenant making, and that is what we're doing today. And and as time goes by, we'll probably learn at some point that throughout history, there have been those upon the isles of the sea that these covenants have been administered throughout time, and they just were not all come under one roof, so to speak. Come on, more scripture. Exactly right. Bring it up. <laughs> The Alma goes about, organizes the church, ordains priests. He, he gives others the same authority to, to baptize and, and to do what he does. And like I said, they, he commands them that they should all teach the same thing, teach about the Messiah, teach about faith and repentance and salvation through redemption. And, you know, only like, don't be making stuff up. Just stick to the prophets, stick to what we know to be true. And... Life is good. Well, we have to understand, too, is that he had the experience of what happens under King Noah and his wicked priests. It's like, you've, we've got to be very tight about what we're doing here and how we're teaching. That's true. Like they, they were, the priests were probably just going out and teaching whatever they felt like teaching exactly that day, whatever right. benefited them. Well, it was exactly as we learn in the temple. It was the philosophies of man probably mingled with some scripture. They would use the sophistry of truth and mix it in with what they wanted and the perspective they wanted. Like... Yeah, but we need to be chaste. But if we are chaste with multiple wives and concubines, that's okay too. Like the wicked priests of King Noah were trying to kind of have their cake and eat it too. And Alma was very aware of that. He had seen by own experience how if you're not very tight and close to the spirit mm. about teaching these things and following scripture and following Alma, who was the voice of God in that area at that time then it can go astray really quick. He was cognizant of that. And then what Alma, what is Alma what is Alma essentially doing by organizing the church? He's actually establishing Zion. Yeah. Then use that word. That's what he's doing. Yeah. Right? Because it's he, where does he teach? There should be no contention with one another. Mm-hmm. Exactly what President Nelson's teaching. Mm-hmm. The priests right no priestcraft like the priests should labor with their own hands for their own support. Mm-hmm. And he teaches the law of consecration to yeah. them. Uh, commanded that the people of the church should impart of their substance, everyone according to that which he had. If he had more abundantly, he should impart more abundantly. And of him that had but little, but little should be required. And to him that had not should be given. And thus they should impart of their substance of their own free will and good desires mm-hmm. towards God. I mean, this this chapter here is kind of a... a, a a crash course on the law of consecration. And if you ever have asked yourself, well, how do we, how do we uh, live the law of consecration today? Because when you look at Missouri and the United Order and say, okay, well, we're not doing that. Well, how do I live the law of consecration? There it is. We should impart of our substance, of our money, resources, assets, whatever we have, time, talents. We should impart of our substance by our own free will and good desire yep. towards God. Mm-hmm. Like, don't wait for the church or the bishop or anybody to come and say, can you can you help with this? We need to be proactive mm-hmm. and seeking out opportunities to 
and part of our substance. And this is always the sign or the witness, essentially, that a people have become one in Zion or have a Zion heart. Anywhere in the scriptures, whether, whether it's the people of Enoch or at times throughout the Old Testament or especially in the New Testament, and then several times throughout the Book of Mormon, it talks about the people having all things equal, essentially meaning we we do not covet the things of this world any longer, yeah. and we actually co- covet or seek to uplift and to bring all men up to a point in which they can receive the goodness of God and feel that goodness of God. Anytime that happens is exactly what's happening here. We see that Zion is being established. And in fact, in verse 29, it says, you know, he tells them, walk up rightly. And it says, imparting to one another typically and spiritually according to their needs and wants. And that the people went about doing that. They started to do that. They were building Zion individually, but then as a whole, as a collective, they were willingly yeah. participating in that. Well, and a lot of suffering in the world has been caused by the lack of of Zion yeah. principles yeah. and the lack of Zion being on the earth. So what I mean by that is like, there are those that ha- do not have temporal success. do not have even basic necessities. Mm-hmm. Like what it says here of them that had not should be given. Mm-hmm. There's always that class of, of person on the earth that needs help, mm-hmm. that needs a, a, some kind of social safety net. Mm-hmm. And when Zion is not voluntarily established by righteous people those who are in that situation well what happens well they they begin seeking for the government to organize politically to kind of force but through coercion that safety net to be established Mm -hmm. through you know and and that turns into social programs and social welfare which is is as we see here is important is necessary but when you start doing it through through government through coercion that's just the sip, slippery slope to corruption yeah. and, and tyranny. And the gospel teaches, yes, we need social programs. We need social assistance. We need to, we need that those who are rich give to the poor, but it, it should be done by the gospel of Jesus Christ through spiritual conversion. Mm-hmm. And all of that will be established voluntarily. Mm-hmm. We will not need governmental intervention. Yeah. For, for things to happen like the, the the people or let's say the church right will will take care of that will provide that that'll be part of like an institutional part of society itself mm-hmm. not something like through the uh, you know politics and government and kind of institutions controlled by men yeah well this is uh, an interesting aspect of this is you can always tell Babylon because Babylon has an enforcement mechanism or enforcement arm to 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 enforce and compel um, uh, what's what's the word to to compel people to live a certain way. There's there's an enforcement mechanism, right? This is some of the things people talk about the judiciary in America that you know the Supreme Court, or whatever. They actually don't have an enforcement arm. There's no army or military or or personnel standing by to go out and enforce anything that the judiciary decides well it's kind of the executive branch well takes fair that's fair they do kind of do that on their behalf however we see that in the kingdom of god because everything is is agency and acting on agents there's actually no compulsive force in the kingdom of god to require anyone to do anything it is always of your own free will yep like that is always the case whereas babylon takes the opposite approach and they will even cloak that in for the good of the majority for the good of all we need to compel and coerce these people to live a certain way they're all about mingling it with scripture exactly right and so for those who say well that you know the church today that's a cult that's a cult-like mentality actually if you look at things through reason and logic the compulsion and being forced to comply in Babylon, in the world, is more cult-like than in the gospel where all things are yep. done of free will and of your own agency. And ultimately, if you choose not to live those standards, it is you that ultimately falls away and chooses to exit. No one forces that upon you. And even if you are excommunicated or put on disciplinary action, there's always an opportunity to come back. 
there's there's never that permanent exclusion from the gospel, but most choose not to. You don't even have to go to that if you don't Exactly. Want. You don't have to show up for that if you <laughs> there's no enforcement or compulsive arm of the gospel. So and Babylon always has that. The government's a cult. You heard it here first. Well, you, that is a hundred percent correct. <laughs> That's a hundred percent correct. Uh, we're on a list now. Yeah. Well, we already were. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Oh, here's another fun slide. Mormon, Mormon, Mormon. Yeah. Mormon, 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 Mormon. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is just kind of a, 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 a funny verse here. It came to pass that all this was done in Mormon. By the waters of Mormon, the forest of Mormon, the place of Mormon. The Mormon is really wants you to know that all this is happening yeah. in Mormon. <laughs> and uh, it, it's kind of silly, but uh, the, our, our local mission president here, uh, uh, out of at a, at a fireside, he, he shared this verse and he kind of had an interesting thought, which I just wanted to share. But he said, he said, maybe, maybe the idea here is that the Book of Mormon mm. is maybe less about the man, more the individual, the yeah. individual, and maybe it's more about an experience, mm. and that experience is what's happening in the place of Mormon. Mm -hmm. That experience is covenant relationship with God. It's mm. the Spirit coming upon man in abundance. It's it's the elect gathering themselves together and establishing Zion. Right? That is the experience of Mormon. That is that is what we that is what we see happening in the place of Mormon. So the fact that we have the Book of Mormon, maybe that title suggests a lot more than kind of what we what, the, the individual who abridged it yeah right. maybe it's really that this book is designed to lead us to that same experience and that mm -hmm. same relationship with christ and i just thought that was a very profound idea to get out of a verse that seems kind of kind of funny almost kind of comical yeah first, yeah mormon 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 okay and then they're forced to flee <laughs> So the people of Alma, they're having some success, right, in secret. And, but then uh, they're having success, and the king hears about it and yep. finds out Takes about notice. it, and they're forced to flee to the wilderness, take up their tents and their families and depart. So this goes back to our teaching, what, you know, what we were talking about early on, that like being Christian, being a follower of truth, very often... Uh, invites persecution yeah and like what you were saying babylon is not about the gospel mm -hmm. and it will organize itself and establish laws and systems that to remove the truth mm -hmm. to remove god and jesus christ and the covenant and the ability to be the covenant people from society yeah i mean look at i mean that's that's what we see babylon's all about the separation of the church from the state okay now i know that phrase is more about you know the this the uh, the ability for the the state to impose religion but i mean when you when you separate the truth out of society you're essentially imposing another religion like an, an atheistic yeah society and it's um i mean like we you go to public schools you go to anywhere in babylon and no god no prayer no no truth nothing like you it, you cannot participate in society and be a devout christian yeah right it's just and, and that just become and the, the more uh the state grows and becomes more powerful the more that freedom and that ability is taken from us and that's that's what we were hinting at early on is that like it it may very well even come to the point in this country where you know, being a member of the church is a is a viewed as a criminal activity. Mm -hmm. That would, I mean, we look at that and say that's crazy, but it happened here, didn't it? Yeah. Well, and that's we've already seen this, and so we shouldn't be naive and ignorant to it. It happens all throughout the Book of Mormon. Many of the great patriarchs were forced to flee because their desire and their willingness to act on truth. And principle and to do what God commands them to do forces them to be um, 
criminalized and cast out of the society or Babylon in which they found themselves. We see that in early church history. They started to live the commandments of God and what happened everywhere they went, every place in which they tried to establish Zion, so to speak, and live the true principles and covenants of God is that they became the target of Babylon because Babylon cannot, it cannot abide that kind of righteousness of free will and agency and the success thereof to exist. And we should not be naive that even though we have existed in this little bit of this lull, when the saints found, you know, the the valley in, in Salt Lake, found Utah, and were able to establish a period and a season of growth, we should not be so ignorant, naive to the fact that the persecution and the incompatibility of Zion truly flourishing within Babylon's walls, Babylon will have no part of it. Yeah. They will not allow it. And the truth is, the day will come. And we already see the seeds being planted where truly practicing the the, the Zion covenant relationship will become against the law. And however you want to take that, in wherever you reside, it will become, you will become an outsider and the full weight of Babylon will start to bear down on you. Mm -hmm. And it's our contention that President Nelson today is seeking to, in his warnings, in his pleadings, in his desires to give and teach truth and prepare people to, to take upon you the covenants and really understand their meaning. He's preparing people for that coming day in the not too distant future where things are going to get tough. Yes. Truly being a covenant child of God will not be so casual. You will not be able to just do it because things are sunshine and rainbows. You will have to do it in a period of true tribulation. And we'll see that coming for Alma and his people. And then chapters 19 to 21 is pretty much political turmoil. Mm. Oh yeah, we just had to <laughs> summarize. There's so much going on. Yeah, we just, we just we, I just, I just put it all here, so we can just talk through it. So we see the people start to rise up and rebel against King Noah. King Noah, yeah. So a man Gideon starts to tries to take them out. Tries, to, I mean, again, a righteous, seemingly righteous man, right, representing the people with righteous desires. Well, he I, becomes. A political hitman. And what's interesting here is that Alma and the righteous, they have fleed. They're gone because of Noah and his persecution. Right. So now Babylon, in this case, or those that were in the land of Nephi here, they're left to fight amongst themselves. Like, these were not necessarily the righteous who were left behind. These were those who were living a very worldly, very telestial law. And what do we see? Their infighting starts to happen. We see that today. I mean, straight well, up, we see that happening yeah. in our own country today. And Gideon, he's yeah, he wasn't one of the the baptized with Alma, but he clearly had the best interests of his people yeah. in mind. Because we see later, he's going to continue working, uh, you know, with Limhi and with, mm -hmm. with the people to to get out of bondage. Mm -hmm. So maybe, yeah, maybe maybe not a, a righteous man in the sense of well, he was certainly humble at that point later on, so he becomes righteous. Yeah. But he he decides he's going to take out King Noah mm -hmm. and. Um, He's just about successful in doing so. Chases yeah. them up the tower and everything. Yep. And then they look out, and the Lamanites are at the door, ready to conquer. They're like, "Oh snap! <laughs> we we got bigger fish bigger, to fry. Bigger, yeah, bigger problems afoot." <laughs> and the Lamanites come in, and they start to conquer, and they're going to kill everybody. And then they're like, "Hey, actually, maybe maybe we'll keep her around because these are some pretty good looking women." Yeah. Yep. And so they take the women. They take King Noah. Um, there's a whole drama where King Noah ends up being killed yeah. by fire, nonetheless, which is extremely ironic, yeah. because that's how King Noah took out... Oh, that was a prophecy of Abinadi. Abinadi, yeah. right? Well, one of the things I want to point out here as well is that when it talks about the Lamanites looking upon the, the daughters of the, the people of King Noah, and they were pacified by them, essentially what had happened was because of iniquity, the posterity of these people had to be sacrificed. The posterity of these people were given unto the Lamanites, essentially, to pacify them. And whatever implications that that has with it, whatever that really means, they ultimately sacrificed the long-term salvation and, and well-being of their children to have to address the immediate temporal situation they found themselves because of iniquity, because of their wickedness. And that should be a warning and a message for us. 
is that if we choose to live right wickedly, if we choose to act out iniquity in our lives, there is a very high likelihood that that will come back on us and not just affect us, but it will it will require a sacrifice of our posterity and and those that we should have been leading in righteousness and of the sins of the fathers. Exactly right. Concept, right. Yeah. Very interesting. When we see wickedness impacts our spiritual and eternal inheritance. Exactly right. And that the whole whole point of inheritance is not just what we receive from the Father, but also what we uh, are able to provide. Yep. The stewardship we have. In yeah. our, our, our posterity. And let's see here. So then Noah's son, Limhi, is essentially put into power, forced yeah. to make an oath to the Lamanites. He becomes kind of the puppet. Yep. Yeah. Over society, and but he's a pretty good dude. Mm-hmm. He establishes peace in the land for two years. That's mm-hmm. about all the Nephites ever get. They ever get, yeah, it's a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and then Noah's priests uh, are, you know, running amok in the wilderness, and they're all still angry at the the Lamanites for taking their women, and so they go and they kidnap Lamanite women. Yeah, Lamanite and, daughters, and 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 that and that causes wars, you know, between the Lamanites and the people of Limhi and. You know, Limhi has to like smooth things over with the Lamanites. He's like, "Why are we fighting?" And because you stole our daughters, and he's like, "No, that wasn't us." Yeah. He's like, oh, well, my bad. And that's <laughs> when Gideon actually steps up again and say, "Hey, remember the wicked priests of King Noah? Yeah, was They're in the wilderness. It was likely them." And the king of the Lamanites was apparently pacified he was like, by oh, that explanation. That makes sense. Yeah, that actually. <laughs> Why didn't you say so? <laughs> so they kind of smooth things over again, but then the Lamanites. Apparently, a lot of the Lamanite people were not so satisfied with that yeah. explanation. Well, and and Lemhi's people were prospering again. There was peace. They were doing well. They were prospering. And that created, as what always happens, that, that jealousy, that greed, that anger about, wait a minute, why are these people doing so well when they're the ones that have kind of screwed us over, you know? And so Lamanites start growing in resentment and hatred towards people of Lemhi. And then pe- the people of Lemhi also... Right, um, start you know suffering from that resentment, that mm-hmm. hatred, and, yep. and the the kind of passive aggressive persecution that yep. they're they're in. So yep. the people of Limhi start taking up arms and say, "Okay, well let's well let let let's go to war with with the Lamanites." So now they start instigating the wars. They go to war three times. They fail, mm-hmm. and after all of that they're finally humbled and realize and they become aware to the reality of their situation and they become very aware that the bondage that they're in is their own fault mm-hmm. it's the consequence of iniquity and everything they're experiencing is the fulfillment of abinadi's prophecies yeah and that finally puts them into the proper spirit yeah to come back un- unto god well and that should be a if if we're likening this to ourselves, one, hopefully we're not in that place where they are, where they seek through their own strength first, and not just once, but multiple times, like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. They don't turn to God at all. They they trusted in their own flesh and in their own power, which they failed at miserably. But that should that should teach us and give us a lesson that sometimes we have wayward children or loved ones that we care about, those that we want to see happy, those that we want to see them succeed. But they continue to do things their own way, right? They, 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 they have to learn through the school of hard knocks. And some of us do that. And that's kind of, that's not the ideal path. But sometimes that is a path that people follow that, that will require them essentially to get to a point where they are forced and compelled to be humble. Now, the downside is sometimes people never get to that point. But you can't force them regardless. doesn't matter. So if you have people in your life, loved ones in your life, sometimes you have to allow them to experience and to feel the consequences of their unrighteous choices, not because you want to see them suffer, but because through that suffering, which is not wasted on the Lord, they finally can get to a point of humility where things can start to change and they can start to be transformed. And unfortunately, that will take time for a lot of people. And we shouldn't lose faith because we continue to see people acting wickedly yeah. or living in iniquity. Yeah. And that, like, those, 
those difficult times, right? That often like is that is the mechanism mm -hmm. for repentance, like yeah. to bring people to humility. Mm -hmm. And it can, as we're going to see, it can take time. Yeah, right. That was that was a Benedict's prophecy, right? You're when you, if if you fall into iniquity, when you finally come around. It's going to be slow getting out of it. Yeah. You're going to fall into bondage. And the, like the Lord's not just going to come and take away all the problems that you yourself caused. Like there's no justice in that. Yeah. There's no gain, of, you know, experience learned from that situation. Like that's not, that's not the purpose of mortal existence. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, that this is the example we see here. They, they finally humbled themselves, it says, even to the dust, subjecting themselves to the yoke of bondage. Yeah. So I mean that's that that's that principle of of you know that we see in the scripture sometimes of kind of recognizing your nothingness mm -hmm. where like recognizing that you can't save yourself through your own the strengths yeah like that there's the gospel there's like there's there's an eternal system in place and it's it's not you saving yourself that ain't how it works um, but subject I, I I bolded this here subjecting themselves to the yoke of bondage like they accepted their situation yeah. like they became subject like they 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 became voluntary subjects or you know to to the Lamanites and to the situation they were in and to their taxes and to the persecution they they became humbled and just aware and accept in in full acceptance of like you know we we got to lay in in. In, in the bed we made. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's that is a requirement for those who truly live, proactively live in iniquity. For those of us who who have gone that road and who have lived that way and that have, and have been fully invested in Babylon and the ways of the world. If you desire to come back, there is that point in which you say, "At, at, at this point, I will take whatever is required. I will suffer whatever is required." Lord, as long as you're with me, I don't care about the consequences anymore. I don't care about what I must suffer through, what trials and tribulations I must continue to endure so long as the Lord is with me because you get so tired of knowing that you are living by your own free will without the Lord by your side because you've chosen to go a separate path away from him. And when you get to that point where it's like the consequences of this world don't matter to me anymore. I just want the Lord next to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I just have to know I have a relationship with him once again. And even if that means I've got to continue to suffer, so be it. Like, I've got to know he's there next to me. And the moment you desire that, he's right there. He's right there with you. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's when you receive the love of God in your yep. life. You become aware of your redeemed status, the grace of Christ, the remission of sins falls upon you. Mm -hmm. Even if there is consequences and you know, steps to, to get yourself out of, out of, out of the situation you're in. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, for example, even if you have to go through disciplinary action in the church, you can, you can be going through disciplinary action in the church, but also be filled with a spirit of peace and remission yep. of sins, right? Because we're, forgiveness is immediate. Mm -hmm. When we turn to the Lord, when we turn to Jesus Christ and seek forgiveness, it's immediate. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's like, there are consequences to, to, mm -hmm. The, the sins we've done that could be that, that could be extended or, or long lasting, but the forgiveness of sin, the grace of Jesus Christ, is immediate and it's always there. We can yeah. always access it if we have pureness and sincerity of heart. Well, the grace of Christ always triumphs over justice, but Christ does not. He is not an ambassador for, nor does he make it acceptable to live sin, to live iniquity. And if the process was you can choose to live however you want, and then the, the second you decide to repent, all of the problems that you've been harvesting, that you've been, you've been sowing, are just going to go away. I'll just make them totally go away. That would completely yeah. deny justice at all. Now, grace triumphs over justice, but that does not mean justice um, is 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 completely vanquished. Justice still exists. The two must exist, yes. and that there are laws and principles of those laws, outcomes of those laws. And when you sow certain telestial laws, the consequences of that will be received. However, the minute you turn to the Lord, He can help ease the burden of those consequences. He can help remove the sting 
of the of those consequences because that doesn't go away. Christ provides resurrection for all of us, but does he take away death from us? No, that is a natural consequence of the fallen world in which we live. He doesn't just say, you don't have to suffer death now because you've turned to me. Like that's the perfect example of all will face that. All will suffer that demand of justice. We all will die. But through Christ, we will overcome that. And that mm-hmm. burden will be lifted off of us. It's no different for anything we do day to day. There are consequences. Justice will have its way. But Christ will help alleviate that and help us rise above that consequences. But those consequences still exist. And, and what you're teaching here is that atonement makes justice and mercy perfectly compatible. Correct. And that's the plan of God. Mm-hmm. And so the people did cry mightily unto God. They were humbled. Mm-hmm. They started seeking God. But God was slow to hear their cries because mm-hmm. that was the promise that was made from the prophet of Benedine. Yep. And the Lord did not see fit to deliver them out of bondage. However, the Lord did see fit to allow them to begin to prosper by degrees, yeah. little by little, line upon line, as uh, as they cried unto the Lord, as that humility really was taking root in their hearts, they began to see blessings and prosperity come into their, their lives and, and into the society by degrees, little by little. Yeah. And... Well, the Lord allows you to, when he starts providing blessings or when he starts providing additional truth, line upon line, it's actually an opportunity for you to be proven to say, okay, I I want this now. I'm willing to live by this now. And he doesn't give you too much all at once. He gives you a portion to say, okay, now prove to me that you can live this. We see that in the temple, in the endowment. Go down, give further light and knowledge. Are they true and faithful to it? Oh, they are. Let's give them additional. Let's give them. A, he doesn't try to give you everything all at once so that ultimately you you fail. He's trying to give you a little at a time so that you can prove to yourself. Yeah, I may have made mistakes, but now I am overcoming. I am starting and through the grace of Christ and that enabling power. I'm starting to rise above what I used to be. And that happens line upon line, a little here, a little there. So they began to prosper. And then they're like, this is about the time when Mosiah was like, hey, whatever happened to those people? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> they start crying to the Lord. And then simultaneously in Zarahemla, Mosiah is like, whatever happened to those people of Zena? Like anyone heard from them lately? And then he sends an elite task. At least as we said before. <laughs> to find that. Yeah. And then, so this is, they begin to prosper by degrees. They're humbled. And then Ammon shows up and they're like, we're saved. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> And everyone's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> What's been going on here? <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, you know, we they group huddle. And they're like, how are we going to get out of here? And then uh, Gideon's like, six, so I've been uh, I've been going undercover. Mm-hmm. And, and, and going out as a spy and checking in on the Lamanites. And turns out the, the night guard... Uh, they get pretty drunk. <laughs> they get pretty drunk in the evening. We may be able to use that to our advantage. We might be able to send them the good stuff and knock them out even longer than normal. <laughs> so, uh, interestingly, basically, the summary here is: they escape while the Lamanites are drunk. Yep. Correct. They wait for the night. They get they get the Lamanites are drunk and they 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 flee. Mm-hmm. So, it turns out, deliverance wasn't that hard after all. <laughs> You just had to know where to look. <laughs> well, they had to have Ammon there to know where they were going to flee to. to correct. They didn't know how to correct. get They had to have there. a compass to get where they needed to go. Right. Well, and you know, the interesting thing is we joked about Ammon and, and the guys that went up there with him kind of being this elite task force. But apparently, you can kind of glean, they must have been very skilled. Because not only were they able to find the land of Nephi, which others had not been able to do, but then when they flee with King Limhi and his people, it, it goes on to say that they they woke up and realized, where'd everybody go? They chase after King Limhi and his people, and after a couple days, they lost the tracks. Ammon knew his, the guys that were with him were elite, and they understood not only how can we escape, but how can we escape in a way in which 
we can cover our tracks and not allow them to follow us, even with this vast yeah. group of people. We don't want wars coming to their head. Exactly. So they were apparently very skilled in the art of, I you know, the you. wilderness. They were Boy Scouts to the nth degree. And they were an elite test. They were. That's what I'm saying. It is <laughs> proof of that here in the scriptures. <laughs> They were they were like Mosiah's Navy SEALs of the day. Like you've got to go get these guys out of there. <laughs> okay, and then chapter 23, 24, we shift our focus to the people of Alma. Mm-hmm. They had fled into the wilderness. What happened to them? It's it's like the same story, but in an inverse of it. I mean, it's like the other side of that coin. Because they it's amazing. They were righteous. They yeah. had already right. they had already voluntarily humbled mm-hmm. themselves. Yep. And accepted the gospel. They were they were forced out of society. They went and, and said, we'll start our own society. Yeah. And it came to pass that they did multiply and prosper exceedingly in the land of Helam. And they built a city, which they called the city of Helam. Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. Mm-hmm. Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Nevertheless, whosoever putteth his trust in him the same shall be lifted up at the last day. Yea, and thus it was with this people. So they were righteous. They got to the um, prospering by degrees much faster. Yep. But they were not free from the consequences of, of of the sins that had been committed previously. The sins of the people, they were not free from the promised consequences um, and from the prophecies of Abinadi, right, that it, it's it, the, the, the the chicken still came home to roost, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, Abinadi had prophesied of it. It's the same principle. You know, the Lord causes the sun and the rain to shine or to fall on both the righteous and the wicked. In this case, Alma and his people had been living in iniquity previously. Yeah. They had been part of the society that upheld wicked King Noah and his wicked priests. They They sustained them in their wickedness. Now, they have repented. They have now come unto truth and knowledge and and received that remission and entered a covenant with God. However, as we've been talking about, that does not automatically say there are not consequences here that are going to have to be born. And and we'll see in the we'll we'll see now what is the difference in how those consequences are born though. Well, we also learn that the purpose of the gospel is not to be free from tribulation right. and suffering yeah. and, and difficult times. That's not the purpose of the gospel. Mm-hmm. The purpose of the gospel is to empower us despite mm-hmm. difficult times and the re- and, and and the reality of being alive. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the reality of life. Well it, inside. it empowers us to overcome. It's the same example I was just saying where we all will die. Death will come for all of us. What does the gospel provide? The power and the ability through Christ to overcome that death. Same thing with with Alma here. The suffering, the bondage, the trials and tribulations of the world will come. What does the gospel allow? What do covenants allow? Covenants allow you to overcome those trials and tribulations. They do not prevent trials and tribulations. So consequences start coming to the people of Alma, but they it looks different and they handle it very, very differently. Yeah. So um, you know Zion, of course, in their in their in their love, they accept some of the uh, wicked priests from King Noah into their society. Yeah. And there is one Amulon who kind of gains some favor on on both sides. It seems, and yeah. he begins to suck up to the Lamanites, and he 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 somehow like weasels his way into a position of power. Well, he was apparently very wise because it talks about how when the Lamanites found these leftover wicked priests of, of King Noah, that they were able to, you know, they they subjected themselves to the Lamanites. They did what they had to do to survive. But then Amulon was apparently crafty enough and wise enough to start gaining favor with, with the king of the Lamanites. And it talks about how he starts teaching them the language of the Nephites. He starts teaching them how to read and how to write. And they start to become essentially educated. Now, it says he purposely did not teach yeah, them the law of Moses. He just stepped right, right back into his false like, yes. his priestcraft under King Noah. Exactly right. Yeah. He had perfected that and he used it to his advantage with the Lamanites and... Through their education, even in worldly things of being able to read and write, they do begin to prosper to greater degrees because of that. 
And so Amulin starts to really gain favor because he takes wisdom, knowledge of the world and allows the Lamanites to start excelling and prospering in ways they had not previously been able to do. And of course, with, you know, like, and, and then the Lamanites, of course, start bringing bondage. Yep. On, on, on to the people of Alba. They just kind of fall, find themselves back in the, the situation they were in previously. But they, like I said, they reach the state of, of humility mm-hmm. and a- accepting the state of their bondage and yeah. the consequences. Um, they, they, seems like they make it there much more quickly. Yeah. And they're. Well, you know, and they turn first to God, too, instead right. of doing what King Limhi's people do, where they try to fight their way out of it. You know, Amulon, who comes in as this kind of tributary king, starts putting these tasks on Alma's people, starts really burdening them. He starts saying, hey, I remember Alma. He was one of the priests like I was, you know, and apparently has a vendetta against Alma. I remember Alma. Yeah. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of that, dude. (laughs) He fled with the rest of us had to stick around, deal with the consequences. And so he's purposely targeting and, and zeroing in on these people that he now has the ability to rule over with the support of the Lamanites. And what do they do as he puts these burdens, these tasks on them? Instead of trying to fight their way out, they immediately, because they had entered the covenant, they immediately turned to God and cried for deliverance. And it came to pass that so great were their afflictions that they began to cry mightily to God. And Amulon commanded them that they should stop their cries. (laughs) I'll have done to that. Like a parent. (laughs) And he put guards over them to watch them, that whosoever should be found calling upon God, should be put to death. I mean, it's kind of like Daniel. Yeah. Right? But it's kind of reminiscent of that oh, well, situation. And this is what we've been talking about, where Babylon and the laws of this world will not allow righteous living, it, because they know it is a it is a, a freedom mechanism. It is a way to rise above yeah. and to come out of it, that, that bondage. It threatens their power. Exactly right. Yes, exactly right. And Alma's people did not raise their voices to the Lord their God vocally. Mm-hmm but did pour out their hearts to him. And he did know the thoughts of their hearts. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their affliction, saying, Lift up your heads, be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me. And I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. So I I highlighted that because I was like, that might have been a better title for this chapter. Yeah, <laughs> Don't yeah. follow me. I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me. Mm-hmm. Like, how beautiful is that? Like, yeah. I mean, th- this should be the comfort and the hope that we have as the Lord's covenant people, that regardless of the the opposition of this world and the situation we find ourselves in, we can have a certainty that the Lord knows of the covenants we have made with him and that he remembers us. And he will look to deliver us out of bondage. The brethren actually talk about this for those that have made covenants with God. They've talked about, you know, basically being entitled to or or being able to call upon the powers of heaven because God remembers the covenants he makes with his children and those children that willingly make covenants with him. And if you are true and faithful to those covenants, as we've been saying, it does not mean the difficulties will not come. It doesn't prevent those things, Mm -hmm. but it does mean that you have the power and the authority through that righteous covenant keeping to call upon the powers of heaven to assist you and to help you. Whereas those who choose not to be true and faithful to covenants, they don't have that same ability and the trials and tribulations are coming for them as well, but there is no guarantee of assistance from the other side. Our last slide here. The Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease. Mm. And they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the the thought there is the Lord did not deliver them out of bondage, but he gave them deliverance even in their bondage. Yep. And that's a very... That's the most powerful thing. Yes. So even in difficulty, in bondage, having the covenant relationship with God, we can have constant and everlasting deliverance, even in adversity, even in oppression, even in tyranny, whatever the case may be. Um, That is what we gain through the covenant relationship Mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ. Well, and the perfect example of that is Jesus Christ. They bruised him, 
They put stripes upon his back. They beat him as best they could. They forced him to carry his cross. They hung him on that cross. They nailed or, or they, they drove nails through his body, essentially. And they did all that they could to strip him of his rights, his privileges and the glory that he was due. And yet through the covenants that he was true and faithful to and the relationship he had with his father, he endured and overcame. And that is a testimony to us is that through those covenants we make and keep, if we are faithful to them, that regardless of what this world does, we've talked about this kind of in a theme today of the world will by necessity continue to increase their persecution of us. If we live true and faithful to the covenants we've made, if we honor those, the world can do whatever it wants, can come up with whatever stratagem it wants. But the power and the ability to overcome the world internally within you, the world cannot strip you of that. And Christ is the perfect example of that, is that he overcame regardless of how they were going to push him and, and beat him down. They could not take from him that which was rightfully due him. And we have that same opportunity through Christ and through his grace when we make and keep those covenants, regardless of what the world does to us temporally and physically. If we choose, we can overcome and rise above those burdens because the, what the Lord promises his covenant children is greater than and everlasting as opposed to the temporal state of being we find ourselves in. And this is an eternal principle. Right. I, as President Nelson has taught, this life is meant to be a master class for the eternities, right? The celestial life is designed for us to grow out of opposition mm -hmm. and learn how to tap into the eternities, into the spirit, into light and truth, that we can have fullness of eternal blessings even in the this situation even in a telestial world right zion is always built in and and comes out of babylon mm -hmm. that's just that's how that's what what always happens yep. so as we i mean and this is a this is a lesson for like for our eternal perspective because we think of like oh we're going to inherit the celestial kingdom and then it's just going to be like no nothing wrong will ever happen again for yep. the rest of eternity mm -hmm. i don't think that's true mm -hmm. i think the whole purpose of the gospel is for us to be able to have right that celestial spirit and that celestial life regardless mm -hmm. of any and every situation that may we may find ourselves in through the eternities right eternal lives like what how do we gain access to eternal lives what's well, through preparing ourselves through the covenant path to bear up our burdens with ease, to have joy and peace and integrity and righteous living, even in difficult times. Yeah. Right? It, kind of the, 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 the doctrine I might use to support this line of thinking is that even the Father himself, God the Father, who is a celestial being and a celestial kingdom and celestial glory, even he had to go through a difficult situation of offering and sacrificing his only begotten son. Do you think that was easy? Do you think that he that that wasn't difficult for him? Of course it was. We know it is. Yeah. We know it was. It's like but but why did why did the father have to do have to go through that if he was you know if if he was a partaker of celestial kingdom? Well, obviously the eternities have their own challenges, have yep. their own situations, have their own trials, have their own op the things that have to be done, right? Part of being charitable and being a disciple of Christ and becoming like him means willing, being willing to take upon yourself difficulties mm -hmm. for the benefit of others. That means the celestial kingdom comes with difficulties, yeah. comes with challenges that we willfully accept upon ourselves for the benefit of others. So... This life, it's, it's a master class of what? Of preparing ourselves to be, to have humility and to be able to have the strength and access of the fullness of light and truth, of the fullness of the spirit 
that we can then eventually become like our Savior mm. and go and do the things that He did to whatever degree possible that we can. And to I mean, I don't I don't know if I don't know how this is gonna you know these thoughts are gonna come across. I don't know if this is you know radical or not to, mm. just to guess these things. But to me, this is empowering. Mm-hmm. Right? This allows me to look to the eternities and actually understand what's available for us, mm-hmm. and that there are great things and great blessings and eternal blessings and our the capacity we have to do to do good through the eternities is is unthinkable it's so it's it's so great and if we can take that eternal perspective and then and then focus it here on our on our our daily life and our daily burdens and realize everything i'm going through right now is is strengthening me it's mm-hmm. giving me experience and it's giving me the ability to take to, to handle greater burdens and to do greater things and i can actually harness that strength that and that that i'm gaining to do good and to bless the lives of others i th- i think that's the gospel of jesus christ and that's what he is trying to help us do and help us become yeah and i i just i just feel as my testimony that 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 these things are true and that I mean, we should really be viewing the reality and the difficulties of this life like through that lens. And that, I think that's how we really gain access to the blessings that are available. Yeah, we know that there is opposition in all things. And that is an eternal law and principle that will not change. And the, the, the idea we get in our heads sometimes is that when we make it or if we make it to the celestial kingdom and to exaltation, that it is going to be this 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 paradise that is um, free of any and all opposition, and that's just simply not the case. The eternal peace, the eternal joy, the eternal happiness that the Father and the Son experience is in spite of, or you maybe you say despite all the trials and tribulations they have to deal with on a daily basis. How you know, however you want to couch that or or, or look at that. It doesn't take away the the difficulties and the trials and tribulations that they are seeking to help us overcome. And as you mentioned, the perfect example of that was Christ. We know that Christ and that the Father are full of grace and truth and compassion and love. And sometimes we look at them as if they're robots that don't have this emotional, compassionate side, when the scriptures teach us the exact opposite, that if they're full of this compassion, if they're full of this love, that means by necessity, they must also understand um, difficulties and sorrow and pain, and they're aware of it, but the peace they have, the joy they have because of the knowledge and the power and the authority and the covenants and the integrity that they have overcomes all of that, doesn't do away with it doesn't mean it never happens. It just means they overcome all of those things in perfection. And that's what they're seeking for us to do, is to learn how to, through grace and through Christ, to learn how to overcome all of these things that we will suffer through, because opposition will always exist. That will always be the case, but through Christ and the model that he provided and the path that he tread, we can learn to overcome those difficulties throughout the eternities, because they will always be there. So we have a testimony that these things are true. Amen. And Jesus Christ is the Savior. And his salvation is offered freely to us. And his grace enables us to take full advantage of our trials and everything that this life throws at us. And the reality is, he is who he is. And the Father is who he is. Because they have gone through it themselves and been perfected by it and come out the other side victorious and that is what enables them to then turn to us and offer the hand of of grace and redemption and salvation and i testify that that is true and that jesus christ is the savior of the world and he has power to overcome all things and to offer redemption to all of god's children in the name of jesus christ amen amen